Okay, all right. Well, good afternoon. Good to see you here. Uh, after lunch, sometimes I give people a warning. You know what happens after lunch. Love goes down here. People have a tendency sometimes to kind of sort of fade out. So I'm going to give you a warning. That is, I have been known to use sleeping people as sermon illustrations. <laughs> so I'm just, uh, you've, been, you've been forewarned. <laughs> now, actually, just about every time I tell an audience that, nobody goes to sleep. <laughs> so stay awake. That's good. All right, well, we have, this is a, a great study we're about to do. Uh, if you have a Bible, open up to Revelation 13. We are continuing our three-part series, starting last night. This is part two, and then later on this afternoon will be part three, called Startling Prophecies for America. We live in America. We all know that. We're all assuming American citizens. And we're going to study about this great country of ours. We're going to find out whether America is in God's book, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 13. Uh, last night we looked at the first beast. And now we're going to look at the second beast and see whether the second beast has anything to do with, with America. America and Bible prophecy. Now, uh, just to let you know, I am well aware, I've been studying prophecy for a long time, and I'm well aware of the fact that there are many well-respected Bible prophecy teachers uh, on radio, television, books, on the internet, heard some of them say this, and I'm well aware of this, that there's a common opinion that when it comes to prophecy and end time events and the last days and who the major players are, I, and I'll, maybe I'll ask you, how many of you have heard this as well, that I've heard people say that America is not in the book of Revelation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've heard this. They'll, they'll say emphatically, America is not there. Right. Uh, they'll see, you know, potentially China or Russia, a lot of things they say swirl around Israel, and they have different interpretations, but there are many Bible scholars that say America is not, it's just not there. And I respectfully disagree. I really do. And, and so I'm going to present my information this afternoon based on the Bible, and you can look at it, you can weigh it all out, and you can decide if I'm, if I'm right or if I'm not. You will, you know, feel free to, uh, to always test everything that I say, and that's what we should all be doing. We should test the ministers that say America's not there. We should test those that say America is there. We should test everything by our Bibles. That sounds like a good plan. Amen. Uh, I try to do that, and I, I want you to do that. I don't want you to take my word for anything. I want you to look at the Bible, see what the Bible says, and then let the Lord guide your mind and come to your own conclusions. I think that's not good, solid advice. So that's what we're going to do. I'll also let you know that I had the privilege one time in 2007 to be invited to speak uh, inside the United States Pentagon. And I was invited by a chaplain of the Pentagon, a Christian man who decided to bring some different speakers to speak uh, to a group that he had. He had a Wednesday morning prayer breakfast. And anybody that wanted to come could come, and he had different speakers present on different topics. So he invited me to speak on, on Bible prophecy. And he told me, he said, you can talk on any prophecy topic that you want. But you've got one shot, so make it a good one. <laughs> and uh, I prayed about it, and I accepted the invitation, and then I, I came to the conclusion that the Lord wanted me to talk about Revelation chapter 13, Amen. and to talk about the role of American prophecy. Amen. So that's what I did. So that's what I'm going to share with you. And I will tell you that when I began, I was told later on that people in the, in the group, there was about 100 people that worked in the Pentagon that were there, staff, you know, work in the military, and that they were skeptical of whether this was really the case. And then, But as I went into my topic and as I built my case, uh, I was told later on, one particular man emailed me and he said, when you first started, I was very skeptical. He said, but by the time you were done, he said, I could see it. Mm -hmm. I 
saw it clear as a bell. And the people responded very well. We passed out a Bible study at the end for uh, people to take it and share with their friends. And I, I told the group, I said, feel free to share this with the president. Share with President Bush at that time. I don't know if they did that or not. Who knows how far it went out. But so this afternoon, you're going to get the same study that I gave at the Pentagon, largely a few, few tweaks. And then we'll see what, uh, what the Lord does. Sound good? All right, so let's have another prayer. Let's pray. I always like to pray before I speak. Dear Father in heaven, this is your time. We have your Bible. We're going to be reading your book of Revelation. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to please help us, and please help me to say the things that are right in your sight. And help us to understand this prophecy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, this is going to be an exciting set. And we will have a, give you a little book at the end of the meeting uh, this afternoon, the United States and Bible Prophecy, free book for you. Plus, we have another one for the last meeting on the Mark of the Beast. So, here we go. I want to start out by telling you a little story. It was in the year 1995 that I was holding a seminar uh, near Vancouver, Washington. I've been holding seminars for many years, and about every month, I'm out somewhere holding a meeting these days, and so I was there in the Vancouver area, and I was driving back and forth to the auditorium day after day. This was a longer series of meetings, and as I was driving, I couldn't miss it. It was on the horizon, just right over there. Very imposing mountain. How many of you have seen this mountain? Mount St. Helens, that's right. Uh, it's actually a volcanic mountain, and I saw it day after day. And if you go back 15 years from 1995, the year 1980, this volcanic mountain began to smoke. It began to spurt. It began to sputter. And those that study uh, volcanoes came to the conclusion that this volcano was getting ready to blow it had become active, and it was dangerous to be anywhere in the area, so they sent out a sensible warning to people that live near, near uh, Mount St. Helens, and they said, you've got to get out of here. We don't know when this thing's going to blow, but it's, it's going to go off. So leave. If you value your life, leave. And most people took warning. I would if I was living there with my family. There was one particular man named Harry Truman, now, not our former president, Harry Truman, but maybe you've heard about him. He was sort of a hermit, and he lived up on the mountain at the base of a lake. I believe it was called Spirit Lake. And he had lived there for a long time, and he decided, I'm not going anywhere. I, I don't believe this mountain's going to go off. And even if it does go off, this is my home, and I'm going to take my chances. When he concluded that that man made a big mistake because that volcano did go off and they never found uh, Brother Truman's body. He died in the volcano, whether it was the ash or the lava or whatever it was. Uh, that was it for him, or just the explosion. And the reason why he lost his life was because he refused to take a sensible warning. Sensible warning. Now, what we're going to do this afternoon is we're going to study what I like to call Mount Revelation chapter 13. I've nicknamed the chapter this, Mount Revelation 13. And as we are going to see, I'm going to attempt to show you clearly that this mountain is spurting and sputtering, that there's smoke coming out of it, that it is very, very active, extremely active. There are things happening in this chapter that are happening right in front of our eyes. And I'm convinced that it won't be long until the final prophecies in Revelation 13 completely explode and come to pass. And God wants us to listen and to take warning. He wants us to take a sensible warning and to make the right decisions so that if we happen to be here when things go off, that we'll know what to do. And we 
won't go down in the final crisis. Does that make sense? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Revelation 13 and take a careful look and see what the Bible has to say. And the main verse that we're going to look at and we're going to study and unpack and explore and dissect and analyze is Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. 13.11. Last night we looked at the first beast in Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. And now we're going to look at the second beast in Revelation 13, verse 11. And there is the verse on the screen. You can read it in your Bible, or you can read it on the screen, either one. John wrote, he wrote this about 2,000 years ago. Uh, scholars say the book of Revelation was probably written around 96 A.D. And at that time, John said, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a what? Yeah. As a dragon, right? Revelation 13, verse 11. I don't know how many of you have really read this verse before or thought about this verse, but it still amazes me how much information God can pack into one verse. This verse is really a, it's really deep and it's really powerful. So we're going to talk about this beast. You see the word beast there on the screen? Now the first thing we have to do, like we talked about last night, in order for us to get anywhere, my microphone's still on. No, I just lost it. Oh, there it goes. I touched it and I thought, did I do it again? No, you're good. I'm good. Okay, I want to keep this mic going. Uh, last night we talked about how when it comes to prophecy, there is one fundamental fact that we have to establish. And that is, what does a beast represent in the first place? Right? We talked about that last night, that we need to really, we need to nail this down. If we, if we make a wrong turn, if we're off on this fundamental question, um, we're going to go a long way away from understanding prophecy. So let's just review a little bit what we talked about last night about a beast. Remember last night I, sh I showed you clearly that Revelation 13 has a parallel chapter in the Old Testament, which was Daniel chapter 7. Now, both chapters talk about the same thing. Both, both chapters talk about lions, a bear, a leopard, a dragon, ten horns, a mouse speaking great things, war on the saints. Same thing in both chapters. They go right together. One chapter helps explain the other chapter. And we talked about this uh, last night, that in Daniel chapter 7, there are four beasts. In verses 4 to 7, there's a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon-like beast with ten horns. And we read this first. I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, just a quick review. Verse 23, an angel is talking to Daniel, and he explained the meaning of his dream. And the angel clearly said that the fourth beast would be the fourth, what? kingdom upon the earth. Right. And we talked about this last night that the first kingdom that Daniel was living in when he had the dream was Babylon. The winged lion, the nation of Babylon. It was Babylon followed by Persia, followed by Greece, followed by the mighty Roman Empire that eventually disintegrated because it was divided among ten barbarian nations. And that this is basic history. You can find this in any library. Most Bible commentaries We'll look at Daniel 7, and they see this very clearly, and the Bible tells us clearly that a beast represents not a computer or not a, uh, you know, a, a man as just a man, but the scripture tells us clearly that a beast represents a kingdom or a nation. That's what the Bible says. Are you with me? So once we nail that down, we have a very clear biblical definition of a beast, what a beast is, if we go back to chapter 13, verse 11, when John says, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth with these two horns like a lamb and speaking as a dragon, we can nail this down based on the fact that this chapter parallels Daniel 7. We can nail down that this verse is talking about the rising of of a mighty kingdom or nation, just like Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Make sense? We'll just stick to the facts, stick to the, the biblical interpretation of the prophecy. Now, the next question, once we know that this is a nation, 
if you notice carefully, it says that this nation, John saw this nation, and it was coming up. In other words, there's a time period where it, it rises into power. Now, approximately, when is this nation coming up? If you look at world history, did John see this nation rising up in ancient times? In the time of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome? Or did he see this nation coming up down near the end of human history? Down near the end of time before Jesus comes back? Well, we don't have to guess. We can know for sure. And the way we know is when you look at Revelation 13 and go down to the end of the chapter, eventually this beast that comes up and speaks like a dragon, he does different things in verses 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, and 17. But in verse 16, he's involved with the enforcement of something. Verse 16 says, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and, and bond, or free and slave, to receive a mark, which is the mark of the beast. And nobody will be able to buy or sell at that time unless they go along with the mark. Now, here's a simple question. Uh, is the mark of the beast something that happened a long time ago? Or is the mark of the beast still something that's coming ahead of us in the future? It's still coming. That's right. The mark of the beast is something that happens right before Jesus comes. So the mark of the beast is an end time event. And this beast is involved with the enforcement of the mark. So that tells us this is an end time beast. He's a beast that is very active, just like Revelation, uh, or just like the mountain, you know, spurting and sputtering. This, uh, the volcano was active, and this beast is active when the mark of the beast is enforced. Amen. So that's another, another clue that this is an end time nation. Now here's another critical piece of information. Not only do we have a nation rising up and becoming active at the end of time, but where does he come from? He rises up out of the earth. Now this may seem uh, incidental, but actually this is a very critical intelligence piece of information for those of us that are detectives and trying to understand the prophecy. This is very important. And I'll tell you why this is coming out of the earth. If we go back, and we don't have to actually go back and read it right now, but just to quickly look at the screen, uh, the beasts of Daniel 7, these four great beasts that Daniel saw, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the dragon, where did they come from? They came from the sea. Right. The prophecy is very specific about this. And the same thing with the first beast of Revelation 13. He came out of the sea. John says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw that beast come. So you have the sea beast, and you have an earth beast. They're coming from two different locations. And the beast in Daniel 7, they all came from, from the sea. Now, what in prophecy does sea or water represent? Again, we don't have to guess. I'm glad that God has made this clear for us. He's told us what a beast represents. And he's told us what the water represents. He did that in Revelation 17. If you turn to Revelation 17, we're not going to spend a lot of time studying about this woman, this mysterious woman in Revelation 17, but we'll look at a few key things. Revelation 17 is all about a woman, a Babylonian harlot. She's called in verse 5, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. She represents false religion, different forms of false religion that rise up. Now, it's interesting that in verse 1, the Bible says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me. And he said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits, and where does she sit? She sits on many waters. So there's a, there's a lot of waters that are underneath of her. Now, what does the waters represent? Well, we don't have to guess. We have an answer in verse 15. Just like in Daniel's dream, the angel said that the 
fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. So in this vision, an angel told John what the waters represent. Verse 15, then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are, in other words, the waters are symbolic and they represent something. They are what? It says, uh, the text says, they are people and multitudes and nations and tongues that this woman rides this beast that is supported by multitudes of different uh, groups of people. Lots and lots and lots of people. And if you think about Daniel 7, the nations of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the mighty Roman Empire, these nations rose out of the sea, or out of the ocean, or out of the waters of multitudes of different kinds of people and nationalities, languages. That's just a basic fact of history. Uh, they came out of Europe, they came out of the Middle East, and they were surrounded by lots and lots of people. So waters in prophecy represents multitudes and lots of people. Amen. Make sense? Now, if the water represents a lot of people, then in contrast, the earth, in uh, contrast to the water, would represent an area where there might be some people, but not a whole lot of people. It's going to be more, more of a wilderness type of an area. It's an area where there are not multitudes, nations, and different languages. So let's just keep building the case, keep putting the uh, points together. We have John seeing another nation, a mighty nation, coming up down near the end times and becoming very active at the time of the mark of the beast. He does not come out of a territory where there's a whole lot of people. He comes out of a more of a wilderness area where there aren't so many people. Got it? Point by point by point, the prophecy needs to be uh, interpreted and understood. Now, next point, there's more. It's amazing, like I said, how much God can pack into one little verse. It says that this nation not only comes out of the earth, but he has, he has two horns like a lamb. Now this is very, very specific. Now two, two horns would represent some kind of a division of power within the governmental structure of this nation. And the fact that he has horns, two horns, is very significant, especially what is uh, significant is what is not on top of those horns. Now you have to really you know, do some study on this to put the pieces together, but these horns, the two horns of the second beast, the earth beast, are missing something. They're missing something that the first beast has on its horns. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember when we read first, uh, Revelation 13 verse 1, he talks about the first beast coming up out of the water, not the earth. He has ten horns, and each of those horns has something on them. Every horn has a crown. That's right, crowns. Upon his horns, ten crowns. Now, when you think of a crown, what do you think of? You think of a king. That's right. Crowns represent kingly power represent uh, monarchies. And as we talked about this last night, we talked about how the first beast is really a combination of uh, church and state. It is an organization that has a monarch, that has someone that's like a king at the head of that first beast, which we uh, talked about last night. But the second beast, in Revelation 13, this has two horns, that have no crowns. Now, if crowns represent kingly power, then no crowns would represent uh, a nation that has some kind of a governmental structure that is not ruled by a king. 
It's not a monarchy. It, it would be more of a, of a nation that would be ruled, if I could say it this way, uh, of the people, by the people, for the people. It's a, it's a, it's a de more of a democracy than it is uh, a royal kingship, like Babylon had a king, King Nebuchadnezzar. Medo-Persia had a king, uh, King Darius. Uh, Alexander the Great was a king. Rome had kings, the Caesars. Today, England has, uh, you know, we have the, the queens and the, the princes. But our nation does not have that. Our nation is different. Our nation is ruled through a different process where people are elected, which is different from uh, the other nations of the past. Now, here's something else that's very significant. These two horns that have no crowns are specifically, it says, like a lamb. And that is very, very interesting. Now, you probably know this. Anybody have any lambs? Do you have any sheep or goats or lambs in your backyard or on your farm? Nobody? Nobody? Okay, well, uh, uh, you probably know that lambs do not actually have horns. This is, a, this is a symbolic prophecy that adds little elements that are very significant and need to be decoded. Now, in the Bible, I talked about this last night, especially Revelation, when it talks about the Lamb, the Lamb in Revelation symbolizes who? It symbolizes Jesus, that's right. We, we know that from chapter 14, verse 1. It says, I saw a Lamb standing on Mount Zion, representing Jesus. Uh, Revelation 13, verse 8, talks about the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 17 talks about the nations going to war against the Lamb, who represents Jesus. So, the Lamb in the Bible and in Revelation is a symbol of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, he's the Lamb. Now, I want to make it clear that I am not saying that this beast is Jesus. Definitely not. The prophecy doesn't say that. But it does say that he has horns like a lamb. In other words, this, this nation has certain lamb-like or Christian features that are somewhat like Jesus. This, and the two horns specifically are lamb-like. Specifically, it's the two horns. Now, what in the world does this mean? Uh, this is this is very interesting. Turn to Re I'm sorry. Keep your finger there in Revelation and turn to Matthew chapter 22. And it was at this point when I was going through this Bible study at the, at the uh, Pentagon, and we went into Matthew chapter 22. I think this was the clincher. You know, they their doubts were slowly disappearing. <laughs> as I was going through this prophecy, proving that we are talking about a nation. We are talking about an end-time nation. We are talking about an end-time nation that comes out of a wilderness area. We are talking about an end-time nation that has a separation of power. We are talking about an end-time nation that doesn't have a, It's not ruled by a king. And, you know, point by point, the group that I was talking to, they were becoming very, very interested. And then when I got to this chapter, it sealed the deal. It just sealed it. They they saw for sure that this this is what this is what it's talking about. Matthew chapter twenty two verses fifteen to twenty two is a scene in the life of Christ where Jesus is being challenged by a group of Pharisees. And if you start with verse fifteen, it says, "Then the Pharisees went and they plotted." how they might entangle him in his talk. Now, the Pharisees were religious leaders, very religious. Uh, Jesus was fulfilling prophecy right in front of them as the Messiah, but they totally missed it. You know, they were, they were kind of like people that said, uh, well, we know the Messiah is coming, but he's not here yet. Just like people say, America is not there in Revelation. And here you have religious people saying the Messiah is not here. And yet he was right there, right in front of them. But he didn't fit the kind of Messiah they were looking for. They were looking for a conquering king. 
And Jesus came as a humble lamb. And he didn't fit their views. And so they decided he was a false prophet, false messiah, and they wanted to, as the text says, they wanted to entangle him in his talk. Which is that interesting terminology, entangle him. Uh, they had no idea, these religious leaders had no idea that the person that was standing in front of them had an IQ off the charts. <laughs> that you, you can't register his IQ. Even the words IQ don't apply to Jesus. <laughs> uh, he was, he's God in human, in human form. But they didn't, they didn't realize that. So uh, verse 16, they sent some of their disciples. I don't know why we're kind of fading in and out on this uh, Microphone. Has this happened before? This? No? I don't know. Okay, well, we'll hope that we can keep going with it. Or else I might have to switch to this. So anyway, they sent some disciples to try to trap him. And it says that in verse 16, that these disciples came to Jesus and they said, now look closely, they said, Teacher, we know that you are true, and you teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone for you are not, you do not regard the person of men. In other words, uh, you you don't care for a person's position or you know their job uh, because you are completely fair and impartial. You're not a respecter of persons. And really, this is maybe it's because this mic is on. I don't know. No, shaking head in the back. Okay. And anyway, if you look at these words, the words that came out of their mouths were were very noble words. I mean, if they only believed what they had said, if they really believed that Jesus was true and taught the way of God in truth and wasn't a respecter of persons, that would be quite an admission. But they didn't believe that at all. They were trying to entangle him in his talk. And they were entangling themselves. They were lying through their teeth. That's what they were doing. So, but they, they thought they were so smart. And they, uh, they came up to Jesus and they said, in verse 17, Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So that was their trick question. And they thought, we are so smart. And we're going to get this guy one way or the other. We've asked him a brilliantly crafted question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar, or shouldn't we? Now, this is what they were thinking. If Jesus would have said, uh, yes, you should pay your taxes to Caesar, they thought, we got it. Because we'll just tell all the Jews, how can this man be our Messiah when he's telling us to pay our taxes to Rome? Rome is the enemy. The real Messiah is going to conquer the Romans. Not tell us to pay our taxes to the Romans. So they thought, if he says, yes, pay your taxes, they got it. But then they thought, ah, but if on the other hand, he says, don't pay your taxes, then they thought, we've got it again. Because then we'll go to Pontius Pilate, we'll go to the Roman authorities, and we'll tell the Roman authorities that here's a man running around Judea claiming to be the Messiah, and he's teaching the people to be disloyal to the government not to pay taxes to the Roman Empire. And then the Romans would come and take him away. So they thought, we got it. There's no way out. No way out. That's what they thought. But remember who they were talking to. They're talking to God in human form. And so, verse 18 says, but Jesus perceived and what did he perceive? Their wickedness. That's right. He saw right through all the things that they were saying, their false words, or their true words that came from false hearts. He saw right through this. And it's interesting that he said to them, the first thing he said was, why do you test me, you hypocrites? You hypocrite. And that word hypocrite, it's a pretty significant word. You know what a hypocrite is? A hypocrite is someone who... Uh, teaches one thing, professes one thing, claims one thing, but he does something else. Mercy. Yeah, mercy. You know, some people say, I'm not going to go to church because this church is full of hypocrites. I'm looking for a perfect church. <laughs> well, if you're looking for a perfect church 
And then you finally find that church and join that church, then guess what? That church is no longer perfect because you're in it. <laughs> you know, we're all we're all faulty, but but we don't need to be hypocrites. And these people were hypocrites. They were saying one thing, but they really were trying to trap him. And it's so interesting that when you think about this 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 verse here. What, what uh, word would we use to describe a beast that comes out of the earth that has two horns like a lamb that claims and professes lamb-like qualities and yet finally speaks like a dragon? What, what does that sound like? It sounds like a hypocrite, right? It's just perfect. You know, the, the keys are perfect as you study this prophecy. Now, there's more. There's more. I'm still, I'm not at my punchline yet. My punchline's coming. So then Jesus said to these hypocrites, he said, show me the tax money. Bring me a coin. Bring me a coin. So, you know, he didn't just answer the question. He didn't say yes or no. He said, bring me a coin. So they brought him, it said they brought him a coin, a denarius. And then, he said to them, he took the coin and he held it up for all to see. And he said, whose image and superscription is on this coin? In other words, whose, whose picture is on, whose image is on the coin? And who did they say? They said Caesar, right? The Roman coins were uh, imprinted with the picture of the current Caesar. And we do the same thing today, although you know, they're not current, but we have on our coins and on our bills, we have pictures of dead presidents, right, in America. And so that's what they did back then. They had uh, Caesar's image on the coin. Now look at what Jesus said. Here's his response. It's a, it's a marvelous response. And I'm going to put it on the screen here, too. So if you don't have a Bible, you can see it right there. Jesus said to them, Jesus is just, he's incredible. You know, you can't trap the Lord. You can't trap the Lord. Jesus said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now this answer was so phenomenal, that verse 22 says, when they heard these words, they marveled, and they left him and went their way. <laughs> they were stumped. Now let's look closely at what Jesus is saying. This is amazing, because it ties into the prophecy. When Jesus said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, Caesar <laughs> represents the government, right? And there are things that do belong to Caesar, such as uh, the government has a legitimate right to collect reasonable taxes from the government citizens. That falls in line with the legitimate sphere of government, is taxation. So they can keep up the roads, you know, and, and uh, keep the country running smoothly through taxes. So uh, government has a right to certain things. But there are other things that government has no business getting involved in. And then he said, and give to God the things that are God's. Now, the things that have to do with God specifically have to do with religion, how we worship. And we in America, thank the Lord, are free to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. We have freedom of religion in America. And what Jesus here is doing is he is, he is drawing a line and he is making a very clear separation, a very clear distinction between the things of Caesar or government and the things of God or religion, right? He is drawing a line. He's saying there's things that belong to Caesar, and those things, like the coins, give it back to Caesar. 
Pay your taxes. Give your thing. Give those things to Caesar. But to God, he says, give, give those things that belong to God to God. Now, I have a copy here. We should all read this. This is not a Bible. But this is, a, this is an old document that most of us have never read. And it's called the Constitution of the United States. Ever read one of these? Uh, it's amazing. And there are ten amendments called the Bill of Rights that are tacked onto this Constitution. And the first amendment of the Bill of Rights that was uh, ratified December 15, 1791, by our founding fathers, when this government in America, when it was the foundation was being laid, here is the first amendment. First part of the Bill of Rights. It says that Congress, and I'm actually going to push my button. Watch the fireworks. See if the fireworks. Oh, yeah. Do you, do you see the fireworks? <laughs> Congress, representing government, shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Now that's called the Establishment Clause. And what that means is that government in America, the American government, does not have a right, according to the Constitution, to uh, establish religion by law. And the reason is because, well, what religion would you establish by law? Would you establish the Catholic religion, or the Protestant religion, or the Baptist, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, or the Wiccans? You know, as soon as government starts deciding which is the true religion, and then passing a law to establish a certain religion, government has crossed the line and gotten into an area it shouldn't be in. The role of the United States government is not to establish religion in this country. And that doesn't mean that there should be no religion in this country. It just means that religion is not to be enforced by law in America. Now that's, called, like I said, that's called the Establishment Clause, but there's a flip side to this. It says, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, which is the Free Exercise Clause. So there's the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. And basically what the First Amendment is doing is it's saying that the things of Caesar and the things of God are separate, and that the government has no right to enforce religion or to stop people from the free exercise of the religion of their choice. That's why we have freedom in America. And I tell you, that principle, that principle of denying the right of government to enforce religion, that principle is a brilliant principle. And if you trace it back, trace it back in history, it was unknown in Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar built a big statue and said, you bow down or you die. He enforced religion. In the Medo-Persian world, they uh, said they had a law that said you can't pray to any god, anybody, uh, for the next 30 days. And Daniel said, I can't do this. I'm going to pray to, to my god in heaven. And what they did was then they threw him into the lions. They threw out Shadrach, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego to the, in the burning fire, burning fire furnace in Babylon, and they threw Daniel into the uh, lion's den in Medo-Persia. Because both times, religion was being enforced, but it was the wrong religion. And I tell my kids that Daniel slept with some furry pillows that night. <laughs> because the Lord protected him in the, uh, in the lion's den. Right? But, but Babylon enforced religion, Medo-Persia enforced religion, uh, Rome certainly enforced religion. The Roman Empire said, if you don't worship Caesar and say that Caesar is, uh, is your Lord, then you're, you're dead. If you look at the Dark Ages, they enforced religion. We talked about this last night. England enforced religion. And there, were, there was a group of people called nonconformists in England who said, we've got to get out of here. So they left, they went to Holland, then they eventually got onto ships and crossed the Atlantic on the Mayflower, and they came to the New World, and eventually 
uh, as time went on, a constitution was established, a Bill of Rights was ratified, and the Bill of Rights said that the government does not have a right to enforce religion on American soil. This is a whole new phenomenon. And if you trace it back, you know, where, where did this idea come from? Who started it? Who was the one who said, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and to God the things that belong to God? It was the Lamb. It was the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 22. And uh, you can study this out. And I put a quote when I was in the Pentagon. I put a quote on the screen from a man named Bancroft who wrote a book on the history of the United States Constitution. And he traced it back right to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right to him. He said it was Jesus himself who, who, who broke out into this new idea that government has no right to enforce religion upon its people. Phenomenal. And that principle of the Lamb is at the heart of the United States Constitution. That is the reason why we have religious freedom in this country right now. Or at least uh, what's left of it. You know, you know, freedom of speech is said, and our religion is being increasingly jeopardized. You're probably aware of that. If you speak out against certain lifestyles, you will be uh, considered a hate speech person and you're in danger of uh, getting in big trouble. So our religious freedoms are being threatened in this country, but they're still here to some extent. We still have them, and that principle is based upon the teachings of Jesus Christ himself. Now, let's go back to the text. <clears throat> Revelation 13, 11 says, I saw another beast, which represents a what? A nation. And it's coming up, arising into power down near the end times, exactly in the end times. It comes out of the earth or the wilderness area. He has two horns, two representing a separation. Horns have no crowns, no kingly power. Like a lamb, based on the principles of Jesus himself, but eventually, how will he speak? Right. Eventually, the prophecy says he will speak as a dragon. In other words, eventually, the, uh, the religious freedom that we have in this country is going to break down. And the dragon, the ultimate dragon, is the devil himself. The ultimate dragon, although in prophecy, the dragon represented the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire certainly used force against the followers of Christ. So we're talking about a shift here, a transition into force. And what it eventually does, it enforces the mark of the beast. That's what Revelation 13 tells us. Now, go back to chapter 13. Revelation 13. Like I said, at that point, when the, uh, when the staff at the Pentagon heard that, they became believers. They saw it clear as a bell. They knew that this is really, this is, uh, this is remarkable when we put this prophecy together. Now, Revelation 13, we just read verse 11. Verse 12 says this. And he which is the second beast, the earth beast, he would exercise all the authority of the first beast, that's the sea beast, the first beast in his presence. In his presence. And he would cause the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So what's happening here is the prophecy says that the second beast, the earth beast, is eventually going to be cooperating with the first beast. He's going to be exercising the same authority, but in his presence. And he would be causing the earth to eventually worship the first beast. 
He's going to point to the first beast. The second beast is going to point to the first beast. And they're going to be working together. That's what the prophecy says. Now, uh, well, let's do a little bit more before I get more specific. Verse 14 says that he, the second beast, is going to deceive those who dwell upon the earth by those signs which he, had, he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. He's going to be a miracle. He's going to work miracles. And then it says he will tell those who dwell upon the earth to make an image of the beast who had a wound by the sword and lived. So the second beast is going to set up an image of the first beast. He's going to cooperate with and promote the first beast, and he's going to set up an image of the first beast. In other words, um, something's going to happen in the, first, in the second beast that's going to change, and it's going to become an image of that first beast. Now remember, we studied that the first beast is a combination of church and state. It's a, it's a governmental structure that enforces religion. That's what the first beast does. Now the second beast is going to set up an image of the first beast. What is an image? What is an image? It's a likeness. Right, in Genesis chapter 1, when God made man, the Bible says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. An image is a likeness. It's, uh, it's something like an original. If you were to go out on a nice day and go into a little boat out on, out on a lake and if the water was calm and if you looked over the edge of the boat and looked at the water, what would you see? You would see an image of you. When you stand in front of a mirror, you see an image of yourself. An image is a likeness of an original. That's what it is. It's a likeness. It's not the original, but it's like the original. And so for the second beast, which government and religion are separate, in the first beast, they're together. What would have to happen for the second beast to set up an image of the first beast? The, uh, the, the, the first amendment would have to break down. And that the government would have to cross over the line. And it would have to start enforcing things it has no right to enforce. And if that were to happen, if the government in the second beast would cross the line and start uh, going against freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and it starts enforcing itself into an area where it has no business, then what would happen is that we would be setting up an image, a likeness of the first beast. In other words, what's going to happen, what happened in Europe is going to be repeated in America. If what happened in Europe is repeated in America, we have the setting up of the image of the beast. Following me? And not only that, but then it says, verse 16 says, he would, he would cause all, there's force, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except he has the mark of the beast or the, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So finally, during the global crisis, this beast enforces the mark upon how many people? Oh. Upon all. Now notice that word, he causes all. That's another clue as to who this power is. This power eventually becomes a superpower. It's a superpower that has the ability to enforce something upon the whole world which affects the global economy and the buying and selling all around the world. It's a superpower that has tremendous military and economic might in spite of its problems. It has this. Now, let me ask you. Uh, last night, we looked at 10 points about the first beast, right? And then I said, I said, there's only one organization that fits this prophecy. Only one. And that was a fact. And last night, we talked about the first beast. And I'll, if you weren't here last night, I'm sorry. Uh, we have a book out there in the back on, on this topic that is for free, that explains everything. 
but we identified the Roman Church as the only organization that fits the prophecy. There's only one. And when you look at the second beast, there's only one nation that fits this prophecy. That is a nation coming up down near the end times, coming out of a wilderness area, with a separation of power, without kingly power, based on the principle of the Lamb, separating government from religion, where government does not have a right to enforce religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof in this country, and that becomes a superpower with the ability to influence the global economy. There, is, there, there are no other nations. Name one that fits every single detail of the prophecy. There aren't any. There's only one, and that is the United States of America. And so my conviction, based on my study of the Bible and of history, it's very clear to me that Revelation 13 is talking about the two great players at the end of time. The, the most powerful religion in the world right now is the Roman church. Over a billion members of that church. There's no person on the planet who has more influence than Pope Francis. I mentioned this last night. Nobody can get a bigger crowd than the Pope. So the first beast is a symbol of the most powerful religion in the world, which is a church-state combination. The second beast is a symbol of the most powerful nation on the earth, which is the United States. You've got the Vatican and America as the big players in Revelation chapter 13. And the prophecy says that they're going to be working together down near the end of time. And they're going to be involved together in the enforcement of the mark of the beast. Now, I don't know how to explain the rest of this prophecy uh, any other way than just being very straightforward and just telling you exactly what's happening. Does that, uh, does that sound good? Amen. I don't know how else to do it. I'll take a little bit more time, then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back for our last, our last meeting. Amen. Now, let me show you something. I've got a few more slides to show you here. Here's a picture, obviously, of President Obama. He is still the president until January 20. <laughs> At least that's the way it looks. It looks that way. It looks like the recount is uh, not going to go through and Donald Trump will become our next president. Now, I don't want to get involved in politics right now, but I do want to show you a very significant statement. This is a press release that came from the White House for immediate release. And the date here is June 18, 2015, if you can see that. Uh, last year in June, President Obama issued a press release from the White House, where he made a statement about Pope Francis's encyclical dealing with climate change. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but last year, President, I mean, uh, Pope Francis issued what's called an encyclical or a circulating letter. It was a major document that was translated into languages all over the world, read by scientists around the world, affecting the Paris Conference on Climate Change, people, uh, nations, governments, politicians, scientists, are very aware of this. And what Pope Francis basically did in this encyclical, translated in many languages, was that he looked at all the disasters, he looked at what's happening on the planet, he looked at what, uh, what they're calling climate change. How many of you have heard of climate change? Heard of climate change? We're talking about a lot in the news these days. And, uh, and basically the idea is, this is the theory, is that there's a lot of disasters, tornadoes, <laughs> and flooding and all kinds of hurricanes and things like this which are happening because of something called global warming. Because the atmosphere is getting warmer. And the reason why the atmosphere is getting warmer is because we've been so dependent on fossil fuels like oil and coal and that this uh, pollution is putting carbon dioxide into the environment which is causing the global warming which then is affecting the atmosphere and the climate. That's where climate change comes from. And that is contributing to more disasters upon the Earth. That's the theory. That disasters are because of climate change. And so Pope Francis, uh, on June 18, issued his encyclical all about climate change and how to become better stewards of the Earth. 
and what we need to be doing to help solve this problem. And he made strong recommendations to the global family of humans on what we all need to be collectively doing and working together to help solve global warming and climate change and the disasters. And I'll talk about this in the next meeting, in the last meeting on the Mark of the Beast, that he said some very significant things in that encyclical which directly are moving us toward the Mark of the Beast. Right in that encyclical, I'll show it to you this afternoon, black and white. Now here's my point, this right here, that President uh, Obama, who represents which of the two beasts, the first one or the second one? Second. The second one, that's right. It's not against him as a person, but he's a representative of America. And Pope Francis represents which beast? First one or the second one? First, first one, right. Nothing against him personally, but he represents the first beast. First. And President Obama is a spokesman for the nation described in prophecy as the second beast. So this is what he said. President Obama said, I welcome His Holiness Pope Francis' encyclical, and I deeply admire the Pope's decision to make the case clearly, powerfully, and with the full moral authority of his position for action on global climate change. Now this is an amazing statement. Look at Revelation 13, verse 7. Look at your Bibles, Revelation 13, 7. The last part of the verse, what will be given to the beast? It says he will be given, my Bible says, authority would be given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Authority would be given to the sect, to the first beast over all the nations of the world. And when President Obama said that Pope Francis makes the case clearly, powerfully, and with the full moral authority of his position, his position as leader of the Roman Church for action on global climate change, President Obama is giving him the authority that Revelation 13 verse 7 says is going to be given to him. This is fulfilling prophecy right in front of our eyes. Right in front of our eyes. Now not only that, but then this is what he said. He said, I believe that the United States must be a leader in this effort. And this effort means the effort to implement Pope Francis's suggestions which are in his encyclical. So the head of the first beast says, I've got a recommendation to help the whole planet solve the climate change problem. And then the president of America, the second beast, says that that we all, that America needs to lead out. We need to use our might. We need to use our influence. We need to use our authority as a nation to implement what's in the Pope's encyclical concerning climate change. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you in the next meeting, after we take a break in just a little bit, I'll tell you in the last meeting that nestled within that encyclical are statements that clearly point us toward the mark of the beast. And I tell you, prophecy is being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. The first beast is here. The second beast is here. They're both very active. They're working together, and they're moving together toward the enforcement of the mark of the beast, and they don't even know it. They don't even know it, and neither do most Americans know it. There is uh, the picture I showed you last night, Pope Francis speaking in front of Congress, and then he spoke in front of Congress, first time a Pope has ever done this, standing ovation, addressing a joint meeting in the U.S. Congress. This was September 24 uh, of last year. I've got his speech. Nine times he referred to his encyclical in that speech. Nine times. And he made some very clear statements in that speech, which tie in with his encyclical, which I will show you in the next meeting, tie in very clearly with the mark of the beast. Mercy. Very clear. Yes, mercy. I tell you, it's amazing. And that most people have no idea what's happening. But prophecy is being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. I know, you know, that's kind of a shocking thought. 
But think about this. When Jesus was here, remember, Jesus was fulfilling prophecy right in front of them, wasn't he? Yeah. And they were totally oblivious to it. Not only were they oblivious to it, but they wanted to entangle him in his talk, and they wanted to get him out of the way. And they didn't realize that ancient prophecies were happening right in front of their eyes. And brothers and sisters, I tell you, in the name of the Lord, I tell you, it's the same thing today. Prophecy is happening right in front of of our eyes and so many of us we don't see it and God is merciful and he wants our eyes to be open so we understand exactly what is happening and what is coming and I will prove all this to you in the last meeting there's no doubt in my mind absolutely no doubt that Mount Revelation 13 is very very active this mountain is spurting and sputtering. Both beasts are alive and well on planet Earth, and they're both working together, and there are things in the works right now to move us toward the mark of the beast, exactly as prophecy says. And the good news is, praise the Lord, on the other side of that, the Lord is coming. Amen. Jesus is going to come. And God wants us to understand these things, and he wants us to be ready. He doesn't want us to be like Harry Truman. He wants us to take sensible warning so we know what to do when the crisis comes. And here's my last verse on the screen, then we'll take a break. And then we'll come back for the last meeting. This is very, uh, this struck me one day that there are 18 verses in Revelation chapter 13. How many did I say? 18. 18. Chapter 13. The first half generally deals with the first beast. The second half deals with the second beast. And then working together with the first beast. Now, if you, if you divide 18, what is the middle verse in Revelation chapter 13? It's 9. That's right. Half of 18 is 9. So verse 9 is the middle verse between the first beast and the second beast. And, and in verse 9, we have Jesus making a statement. Jesus making a statement. Just like he did when he was on earth. When prophecy was fulfilling right in front of people's eyes, Jesus said, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And he says the same thing right there. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. So my question is, are we listening? Are we hearing the rumble of the volcano? Can we, uh, can we see the mountain smoke? Can we see the first beast? Can we see the second beast? Can we see them working together? Do we realize where we are? We're, we're getting closer to the whole stretch. Okay, this is, you know, we're, we're in amazing times, apocalyptic times. It's not an accident that we're here. God is trying to get us ready for the final events. Uh, during the Civil War, and I'll close with this, during the Civil War I heard a story where somebody approached Abraham Lincoln, who was a phenomenal president, approached him and said, Brother Lincoln, do you think that God is on our side in this war with the South, which was largely fought over slavery? He said, Lincoln, Brother Lincoln, President Lincoln, do you think God's on our side in this conflict, this civil war, this terrible battle that's happening within America? And uh, Abraham Lincoln is reported to have thought about that and, and said this. His response was this. He said, I'm not that concerned whether God is on our side or not. He said, my biggest concern is whether we are on his side. Amen. That's my biggest concern. And may God help us. I tell you, if we're on his side, he'll be on our side. Amen. So let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us this afternoon here in, in this church in Wisconsin. We're, we're a small group, but Lord, this is a big subject, and you are talking to us to get us ready for the future. Please bless us, give us more of your Holy Spirit, help us to have an ear to hear, to understand Bible prophecy, bring us back for our last meeting, the grand finale, 
where we talk about the mark of the beast. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's take a break. I'm going to give you 15 minutes. A little bit after four, we'll have our next meeting. Um, where are the books?